All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Vivek Krishnamurthy. Uh, I'm currently a research scientist here at Snorkel AI, and I work for, I work in the computer vision uh, team. Uh, my research interests and my work largely is fine-tuning foundation models on image data as well as multimodal data sets. Uh, today, we're um, very happy uh, and honored to have with us Reza, who is a PhD student at Brown University. He is advised by Professor Stephen Bach. Today, Reza will be presenting two papers with us. to us. The first one will be follow-up differential descriptions, which is language model resolve ambiguities for image classification. And the other one will be if Clip could talk, which is understanding vision language model representations through their preferred concept descriptions. So uh, without any further ado, Reza, please go ahead. The stage is yours. Thank you so much for the introduction. Today, I'll be presenting our work on using LLMs to improve image classification and understand vision language models. In recent years, it has been common that, pe that people have used LLMs to generate data that they are going to later use with vision language models. And it has covered many areas, like generating class descriptions for image classification with vision language models, or even generating training data for vision language models. But one of the main problems here is that the LLM is oblivious to the model or the task that is going to use the data. For example, if you use CClip, OpenClip, or even OpenAI Clip, the LLM is going to generate the same data no matter what. And here in this talk, I'm going to show you that if we adapt the language generation process to the downstream task and model, we can better understand and improve vision language models. And I'm going to do it in two parts. In the first part, I'm going to show you how we can better use LLMs to improve VLM's image classification performance. And in the second part, I'm going to show you how we can adapt LLMs to VLM preferences and understand how they represent various concepts. So for the first part, in this talk, we are going to work with contrast division language models. So let's see how they work. Basically, contrast division language models like CLIP are two giant uh, text encoder and image encoder. And they are trained to encode text and images such that related text and images get a higher similarity score, while unrelated text and images get a lower similarity score. And given this simple property, we can create zero-shot image classifiers with VLMs with ease. For example, we can just describe the classes in natural language and then measure the similarity between class descriptions and images and decide what's the correct label. But it turned out that we are not limited to simple descriptions like a photo of an airplane or a photo of a lemur. And actually, if we provide more detailed information, we can get even better performance. And many works have relied on this simple intuition to create better zero-shot image classifiers. You simply go to one big LLM like ChatGPT and ask ChatGPT to describe the classes that you want to classify. For example, describe a photo of a lemur. And you get a list of descriptions that you will later use as your class descriptions. And this method has improved many image classification tasks in many, many areas. So what's the problem? Let's assume that we want to classify this image, and based on the classes that we have in our data set, we are not sure whether it's a sparrow or a goldfinch. In this setup, if we ask our LLM to describe the sparrow and it describes the brown color, we are lucky. We can rely on this new information to separate sparrow and goldfinch and actually make the correct prediction. But if the LLM describes the conical bill attribute, it's not going to be useful for us, and we cannot do the correct classification. Now let's consider another situation where we want to classify the same image, but this time we're not sure whether it's a sparrow or a wren. And in this case, unlike the previous one, if the LLM describes the brown color, we are out of luck. We cannot use it to resolve the final ambiguity. But if the LLM describes the conical bill attribute, we can actually use it to correctly classify the image. And in short, basically, we need to adapt the class descriptions according to the classes that we have in our data set in order to be able to resolve the ambiguities and make the correct prediction. 
And to do that, we propose follow-up differential descriptions or food, which is a three-stage pipeline to first detect the ambiguities and then use an LLM to generate the information that we need to resolve the ambiguity. In the first step, we want to detect the ambiguous classes. And to do so, we use simple class descriptions for each of the classes without any additional information, just to find out what are the most similar classes to the image. And we define these classes to be ambiguous because they are very similar to the image and the model is having difficulty deciding which one is the correct label. And once we have these classes, these ambiguous classes, we ask an LLM to describe the differences between each pair of ambiguous classes and describe how we can separate their images. And with this information about the differences between ambiguous classes, we create a new prompt ensemble for each of the ambiguous classes that contains all the information for each class from the previous pairwise comparisons. Now, these new prompt ensembles for the ambiguous classes contain all the information that we need in order to resolve the initial ambiguity and make the correct prediction, which is exactly what we do. And with this, we're going to run various experiments to see how it performs and analyze the various parts of the pipeline. How are we finding out like the which classes are getting mistaken for which classes? Actually, uh, we make a simplifying assumption here. Maybe, you know, when here I define the ambiguous classes, it's quite possible that the model in some cases actually is not mistaking the first one for the second one and is quite confident. But in cases that it's not confident and a mistake happens, most, mo most of the time, the class that is being mistaken is among the top five or top 10 similar classes to the image. So we, we basically say, we are gonna describe the differences between the top five or top 10 classes. And if a class is being mistaken, it should be here. So we don't necessarily find the ones that are mistaken and ignore the rest. We just describe the differences for the most similar classes that potentially include the ambiguous ones. We actually rely on the similarity between images and classes to decide which, which classes are similar to the image and thus are ambiguous. But what user determines is that how many ambiguous classes we want to clarify. For example, in this slide, we are uh, clarifying the differences between the top three most ambiguous classes or top three most uh, similar classes to the image. But a user can say, I want to describe the differences between top 10 most ambiguous classes and slightly improve my performance, which we get there later in the talk. So we run this pipeline on 12 fine-grained image classification data sets like COP and PETS, and we try it with uh, the OpenAI clip model with two backbones, the small one and the large one. And we use GPT 3.5 to generate the descriptions. And we, we observe that the average accuracy improves when we generate such precise descriptions that explain the differences between classes. Here in this table, we see template set, which are the set of generic templates like a photo of a cat, a tattoo of a cat, that are just a prompt ensemble without any additional information about the classes. And on the second row, we see the performance of the naive LLM descriptions, which is just going to an LLM and saying to, and asking it to describe a cat or the lemur in our slides earlier without giving it any information about what other classes exist in the data set. On the third row, we see food, which is just uh, what we've gone through right now. And K equals 10 means that we are describing the differences between the 10 most ambiguous classes in our data set for each image. And k equals c means that we are describing the differences between all the classes in our data set. And we observe that by providing the differential information, actually the performance improves. Next, we are going to do some analytical experiments to find out what's the value of these differentiating details. Because you can just say, yeah, you're providing more information, so you get better performance. And they might not even be differentiating. So here we define two types of descriptions. The first one are differential descriptions, which are attributes of classes that differentiate the ambiguous ones. And non-differential descriptions, which are new here, are descriptions that are factually correct, but do not separate the ambiguous classes. You can think of the brown color for sparrow and wren. They're both brown, but knowing that they are brown doesn't help you to separate these two classes. 
And we observe that just being factually correct and providing additional information, although helpful, it's suboptimal and it's not enough. And actually the additional information needs to differentiate the ambiguous classes for us. Another experiment that we run is to study how important these ambiguous classes are. Because for the main part of the clip, for main part of food, we are saying that, okay, I'm just gonna describe the differences between the top three or top 10 most ambiguous classes and ignore the rest. So how much are we losing by ignoring the rest? Here, we run food, but with different values for K. You know, we're gonna measure the accuracy when we describe the differences between the top five most ambiguous classes or top 10 most ambiguous classes, top 20 most ambiguous classes, and so on and so forth. And we observe that actually the bulk of the performance improvements that we get comes from describing the five most ambiguous classes. And describing less and less ambiguous classes beyond that have diminishing gains. So we can use food with just top five or top 10 most ambiguous classes, which lowers the computational costs and still gain a good performance improvement without losing much. And up to this point, we've been using GPT uh, 3.5 or ChatGPT to generate these descriptions. But that's not our favorite because you know, it's proprietary, we don't have always access to it, and uh, a lot of problems that come with private models. So we wanna know if we can do the same thing with publicly available LLMs. And here we use Llama 2 7 billion, and we fine tune Llama 2 on descriptions generated for ImageNet data set with ChatGPT and measure the performance on other data sets that Llama has not seen their descriptions. And we find out that actually Llama 2 learns something about generating descriptions that, it, that generalizes to other data sets other than ImageNet. And on average, the generated descriptions improve the performance compared to before fine tuning for both the small and large vision backbones. And now it's interesting because we haven't shown the model anything about other data sets, but it improves the performance. So we ask, you know, what changes during fine tuning that we get this boost in performance? So we look at the descriptions before and after fine tuning, and we find out that Llama doesn't learn much world knowledge, which is basically correctness in this graph. And the descriptions are correct before and after fine tuning. It's not like some new information about the classes is added to the model. But what changes significantly is the helpfulness, or in other words, is how often the descriptions separate the classes that we expect them to separate. And here we, uh, we observe that after fine tuning, Llama actually learns the structure of the task and generates descriptions that are more helpful for differentiating the ambiguous classes. And this is what drives the boosting performance. Quick question regarding the descriptions. Are most of the descriptions that are generated related to do with the visual features or the visual aspects of the image? Yes, actually uh, we do in-context learning to condition the model specifically to describe the visual perspectives of the images. So uh, at this point, I summarize the first part of the talk, which is we propose follow-up differential descriptions, which is a zero-shot approach that adapts the class descriptions to the target classes in order to improve the performance. And we show the superior performance of food through extensive experiments on 12 fine-grained image classification data sets. We also study the role of ambiguous classes and differentiating, differentiating information for image classification. And at the very end, we fine-tune publicly available language models like Llama 2 to generate differential descriptions and analyze what changes before and after fine-tuning. Now let's start talking about the second part of the talk, which is where we try to understand how vision language models represent different concepts. In the first part, we assumed intuitively that VLMs work like humans do. And if I explain to VLMs what, I, what I'm supposed to see in the image, I'm gonna get a better performance. Like if I tell them that lemurs have a long tail, it's gonna, it's gonna work better. And actually that's what we based uh, our work on, on and many other people to find the best attributes about the classes and actually improve the performance. But it turned out that additional visual information is not the only thing that improves the performance. And if we just add random words and characters, we get a boost in performance again. And there is even further information uh, in previous work that shows us VLMs actually do not follow the assumptions that we make about them, at least not 100% of the time. 
For example, previous work shows that VLM representations of a concept are not often based on its visual characteristics like color and shape. So here in this part of the talk, we want to know how do VLMs represent concepts from the text perspective? What attributes or what type of information helps them identify the images better? And to do that, we propose Extract and Explore. And to give you an overview of what we're going to do with Extract and Explore is in the Extract part, first, we are given a bunch of images for a concept, for example, Lemur or Sparrow. And then we are going to look for descriptions that best describe their, these images from the VLM's perspective, or in other words, get a high cosine similarity with these images. And once we have such descriptions, we are going to look at them and observe and uh, analyze them from various perspectives, like do they describe attributes or are they informative and things like that, to identify what kind of characteristics help models match images to their textual descriptions. And to do this, we are going to ask an LLM to describe the classes for us. For example, we prompt it with things like describe an Abyssinian cat and get a description. And we are going to update this LLM to follow the VLM preferences for best descriptions of a specific class. And how we do that is with reinforcement learning for large language models, which is often referred to as reinforcement learning with human feedback or RLHF in the literature. And here I'm going to give you a one slight overview of how it works. Basically, you get a prompt like what is a cheeseburger? And you have several responses for this one. And you want to adapt your model such that it generates the response that is more favored by the humans. To do so, you assign a reward score to each of the generations. And the higher this reward score, the more humans prefer this specific answer. And once you have these generations, with the corresponding reward, reward score, you can use reinforcement learning algorithms like PPO to update your LLM agent in order to generate responses that get higher and higher reward scores. And we're going to use the same paradigm, but in order to adapt to human preferences, we are going to adapt to vision language model preferences. And to do so, we define our reward function as the cosine similarity between each of the descriptions and the images for that specific concept. And then we're going to use this to update our LLM to get descriptions that achieve a higher similarity score to the related images. And with this reward function, we get this system. And in this system, we have our VLM frozen. We do not update the VLM at all. We just want to update the LLM agent in order to improve the quality of the textual descriptions from VLM perspective. And first, we ask our LLM to describe a class, like describe an Abyssinian cat. And we get a response, like Abyssinian cat has four legs. And then we take this response to our VLM and calculate the cosine similarity between this response and the images of Abyssinian cat. And we pass this cosine similarity as the reward function to the LLM agent and update its parameters so that next time it generates a description that achieves an even higher cosine similarity with Abyssinian cat images. And once we do that for enough iterations, we are going to prompt our LLM again to describe the classes. And this time, we're going to get descriptions like yellow-billed cuckoo is medium-sized, or some unexpected things like I direct your attention to Sparrow. With the um, PPO reward function, can you quickly explain what that KL term is doing? Yeah, actually in PPO, because if we don't have the, the KL term, measures the KL divergence between the model that we have now and the model that we started with. And if we don't have this KL divergence, the model is going to change so much that the generations are almost non, uh, nonsensical. We don't understand what they mean. They are random characters, random words. And we add this KL term to the reward function to keep the updated model close to the original one. So we get sensible descriptions that we can later analyze. And this is standard in all the RLHF work, and everyone have used it before. Okay. Thank you. And once we have these descriptions that we know get a better score from our v from the VLM perspective, we can look at them and see what type of characteristics they share. For example, we can look at them and see if they provide additional information about the classes, or they are spurious uh, and do not contain any additional information about the concept that we want to 
Or we can look at the type of information that they provide, whether it's describing the visual characteristics of the concept or it's providing information about non-visual characteristics, like Lenten rose is a perennial plant native to Europe, which is not about the visual appearance of this specific flower. And if we do this analysis for all of the descriptions that we have, we can understand what type of characteristics this specific VLM prefers. Here, for example, we see the breakdown of descriptions for clip model for flower species. And we observe that half of the descriptions that clip prioritize to represent flowers are spurious and do not provide any information about flowers at all. But 55% of them provide some sort of information about the specific flower species. And among this 55%, only 36% of them are describing the visual appearance of flowers. And 63% are describing other aspects of flowers that are not about their visual appearance. And in our experiments, we're going to do a similar analysis, but across various VLMs and data sets. And specifically, we are going to analyze seven different vision language models that are trained on different data sets and with different objectives. And we're going to use six different fine-grained image classification data sets to do this analysis. First, we're going to verify if we have successfully aligned the LLM with VLM preferences. And to do so, we use the generated descriptions to do image classification with, with each VLM. And if we improve the classification performance compared to a generic set of descriptions that do not provide any information about the classes, we say that the descriptions that X2 has generated contain some sort of information that it, uh, the VLM prefers and thus improves its performance. And it turns out that in 33 out of the 42 VLM dataset combinations, the LLM successfully learns the VLM preferences and improves the performance. And now we're going to look at the descriptions generated for these 33 experiments and see what kind of characteristics these descriptions share. Specifically, we are interested in two types of questions. The first one is how many of these descriptions are spurious? And in general, are VLMs sensitive to spurious descriptions? And we define spurious descriptions to be any description that does not provide any world knowledge about the concept at hand. For example, clip to enlarge the flow of a concept. We also want to see uh, how often VLMs consider non-visual information to represent visual concepts. And we define non-visual descriptions and as any information about the concept that is not about its visual appearance. For example, its home country like Canada or the season that a specific flower is gonna bloom. And for the first question, surprisingly, we find out that spurious descriptions have a major role in VLM representations. And actually, in 26 out of the 33 cases that we actually learn what VLM, VLMs want, the spurious descriptions contribute significantly to the boost in accuracy that we observe. Or in other words, the spurious descriptions contribute significantly to VLM representation of these concepts. Uh, quick question, Reza. Yep. When you, you're you using the um, LLM to basically generate better captions, right? Or like different captions that will help the VLM better classify. So once again, if it was a, since it's a classification task, you're creating like n number of uh, captions, one for each class. And then once again, you just see which has the highest cosine similarity. In each iteration, we are gonna ask, uh, you know, we are, we are, we're gonna update the model. It, at inference time, we are not gonna generate 10 descriptions and figure out which one has the higher cosine similarity. During training, we generate descriptions and based on their cosine similarity, update the LLM so that at inference time, actually everything that we get has a high cosine similarity to the images without doing any filtering. Okay, so that means at inference time, if you, let's say there were two classes, cats and dogs, you would generate one caption for cat, one caption for dog. And for a given image, you would see which one has the higher cosine similarity. Actually, um, to be more inclusive and have a high, uh, larger search space, we 
uh, define 25 questions or 25 prompts for the LLM to ask about different aspects of the uh, of each concept. For example, uh, I don't know, describe a photo of a concept, write a story about a concept, and things like that. And when we want to do classification, we average over these 25 descriptions to get a class representation. And once we have this embedding vector for all of the classes, we compare its cosine similarity to the image to make the final prediction. Okay, so there's some sort of averaging happening and then whichever class has the highest cosine similarity with the average is then declared the choice. Yes, exactly. Got it, okay, thank you. Okay, so in the first part, we understand that spurious descriptions actually contribute significantly to VLM representations. As for our second question, again, we find out that uh, non-visual descriptions also contribute significantly to VLM representations. And out of the 19 VLM dataset combinations that informative descriptions help, 15 of them, which is close to 79%, contain only non-visual information about the concepts, which let us know that non-visual information actually contributes significantly to the boost in accuracy that we observe, and thus, non-visual information actually contributes significantly to VLM representation of a concept. Uh, these two uh, questions about the uh, spurious and non-visual characteristics of descriptions are more about high-level information about how descriptions look like. We also do more analysis about the fine-grained attributes that are described in each caption. And to do so, we select a subset of experiments and manually uh, inspect the descriptions to see uh, what type of attributes is explained in each uh, for each description. And we have two interesting observations here. The first one is that different VLMs prioritize different attributes to represent similar concepts. For example, when we look at the descriptions for the COP data set, which are bird species, we notice that CLIP often prioritizes the attribute size to represent these concepts while a line model prioritizes the attribute habitat to represent these concepts. And we also, because of uh, how interesting this observation is, because all these models are, are trained on uh, internet data and we expect them to at least have uh, similar behavior. To further verify this claim that they represent concepts differently, we use the descriptions generated for one VLM to do classification with another VLM. For example, here, each row is a VLM that is used for classification, and each column is the VLM that is used to calculate the rewards. For example, in the first row and second column, which uh, we see the number 69.82, we use the descriptions generated for the align model to do classification with CLIP. And it turns out that VLMs actually do much better when we give them descriptions that, that contain their preferred attributes and otherwise the performance is suboptimal, which confirms our observation that VLMs represent concepts differently. And we also have another interesting observation based on this analysis. And that is that even the same VLM, for example, a line here, uses different attributes to represent different concepts. For example, when we look at the descriptions generated for flower species, a line often prioritizes information about various parts of the flowers to represent these concepts. But when it comes to uh, bird species, a line often prioritizes information about where this bird lives to represent this concept. And it kind of tells us that if we want to analyze VLMs, we need to do the analysis on a wide range of data sets before drawing any conclusion about their behavior. And finally, I want to point out to one potential use case uh, of X2 for generating new hypotheses for downstream applications, for downstream analysis, and also uh, potentially how we can use X2 to debug uh, the training process for VLMs or data curation for VLMs. And this part is mostly about our observations throughout this project, specifically for the Siglip model which is one of the VLMs that we use in our analysis. And throughout the course of this project, we noticed that Siglip descriptions follow a very specific pattern. Mostly they look like photo credits, like where this photo is downloaded from or who was the photographer and things like that. And also another pattern that we see often 
are software instructions, like click on this image to enlarge it or things like that. And this is uh, observed way more often in Cclip descriptions for almost all data sets than for other VLMs. So it attracted our attention and we wanted to confirm that actually uh, such a bias exists for Cclip and it's not confirmation bias on our side. So we come up with some description templates that resemble the patterns that we observe. For example, a photo of a concept, click to enlarge. Or a photo of a concept, I obtained this photo from the following website. And use these description templates to do classification with two VLMs, one clip and one Cclip. And it turned out that actually Cclip is sensitive to these patterns and its performance improves when it observes these patterns in the descriptions. But another model like Clip is not sensitive to these patterns and the performance barely changes whether these specific patterns exist in the descriptions or not. Okay, now that we know Cclip is sensitive to patterns, how can we use this thing? Although Cclip's pre-training data set is not public, the authors disclose that uh, the pre-training data set, Webly, uses OCR or optical character recognition to generate descriptions for each of the images. And here, there are several hypotheses that we can generate to understand why Cclip is sensitive to these descriptions. For example, is there a correlation between using OCR as a data source and such biases? And if such a correlation exists, what does it mean for future vision language pre-training data sets? Should we rely on OCR? Should we not rely on OCR? If we are relying on OCR, should we come up with more advanced filterings and questions like that? And we believe X2 is a good, uh, useful tool, very flexible to analyze how our designs for data set curation impact the model in downstream. So, um, so basically what I'm gleaning from this um, slide is that um, a lot of the prompts or the captions that you give will have uh, be very influenced by the kind of data that the model saw during pre-training. Um, so I was wondering if you did any experiments across different sizes of the same model. So for example, if I compared a clip VIT B16 versus a clip VIT L16 or L14, since both of them probably were trained on at least a lot of overlapping data, do we see like um, the same breakup when you showed that slide regarding what different models focus on? Or do, um, so do you have any experiments or ablation regarding that? Actually, we don't... Uh... We don't we don't uh, try the same model with def different sizes, mm -hmm. and uh, that's mainly one of the reasons that we do not claim the correlation between our findings and a specific aspect of the model, because mm -hmm. uh, such a claim needs the extensive experiments that uh, we just talked about. But in this paper, uh, we are more broadly interested in uh, the behavior of VLMs in general. You know the the current generation that we have, rather than specific properties of VLMs that cause this behavior. But that's a very interesting direction uh, uh, to explore in the future. And uh, another thing about such kind uh, that kind of analysis is are the computational requirements, because uh, to compare two different VLMs and specifically say either it was the size, it was the batch size, or I don't know the number of parameters or the data set, we need to train multiple of these VLMs and control for other uh, training details in order to be able to conclusively say what caused this specific behavior, which we can do in future work, but uh, in the work that I'm presenting now, we don't have such experiments. Got it, thank you. And to summarize the second part of the talk, I'm gonna reiterate our findings which talk about the uh, significant role of spurious and non-visual descriptions in VLM representations. And we also find out that different VLMs prioritize different attributes to represent similar concepts. Or in other words, different VLMs represent concepts differently. And we also uh, observe that even the same VLM prioritizes different attributes across different data sets. And at the very end, we also look at how X2 can be used to generate new hypotheses for additional analysis or as a debugging tool when developing pre-training models or approaches for vision language models. And to summarize the whole talk, 
Here, we mainly talked about how we can adapt the language generation process to downstream tasks and models in order to better understand and improve vision language models. And in the first part, we looked at how we can adapt the language generation process according to the downstream data sets and improve image classification performance. And the second talk, the second part of the talk, uh, we talked about how we can adapt LLMs according to VLM preferences and as a result, understand how different VLMs encode various concepts. Here, I also want to thank Christina Mengini and my advisor, Stefan Bach, for their help throughout these two projects. And with that, I conclude my talk. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Reza. So uh, Reza, I had actually one other question. One thing that I saw in the food paper yep. was that um, ideally the the enhance you you ask the model specifically for captions that help it differentiate between two identical species of birds or like two you know hard uh, two similar categories and the the answers that it gave you had to do more with you know um visual characteristics or visual features that were present in those images but interestingly enough in ex2 what we're seeing is that what helps classification is spurious things and things that actually do not correspond at all with visual characteristics. So in a way, like, aren't these two kind of um, orthogonal or like, uh, it's kind of weird that one, what helped one in case of classification is saying the exact opposite helps in the other case for classification, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Two things that I want to make clear here is that X2 doesn't say that visual characteristics does do not matter. It, it doesn't say that it doesn't talk about things that do not matter. It mostly talks about things that VLMs are sensitive to and studies that. <laughs> so, you know, all the works that says, you know, we provide a specific type of visual attributes to VLMs and they perform better are still valid and X2 doesn't contradict those. But another thing that X2 adds is that our assumption that VLMs only look at the image and make their final decision uh, might not be 100% correct. And we might uh, want to adjust our decisions according to these new findings. For example, if we don't want to touch VLMs and train new ones, maybe when we want to generate descriptions, we might want to go beyond just uh, visual attributes and also describe other types of attributes for VLMs. And that could be potentially helpful. I was curious because I would assume that when you're doing the RLHF process for um, in the EX2 case, uh, I would have thought that the, from the observation with food, the R, the RLHF process would then encourage it to give more in-depth descriptions of the um, corresponding category in order to help classification. You mean more um, that... visual attributes? Yeah, exactly. Because that would kind of be in line with what you saw with food as well, right? In the sparrow case, you would enhance the captions to say, okay, let's talk more about the sparrow. Let's talk about its beak structure, its wing structure, whatever. Because that is kind of what we saw with food as well, right? Talking about those characteristics helps um, differentiating between ambiguous classes. Okay. Uh, uh, in our results, actually, it's not that all the descriptions are spurious, you know, and we observe mm -hmm. some attributes that actually are about the visual characteristics. For example, mm -hmm. uh, in our manual analysis, there are things about the color, about the size, and um, uh, about the different parts of flowers that are about the visual characteristics. And also in the example that I showed you here, we observed that although a very tiny fraction uh, is about the visual characteristics, which is 36% of 55%, there is still information about the visual characteristics. Mm -hmm. But the thing that you say is exactly valid that if VLMs worked the way that we expected them to work, the RLHF process should have prioritized the visual attributes and give more exactly. in-depth descriptions yeah. mm -hmm. uh, to uh, um, to further improve the performance. But the point that we are making in X2 is that that assumption uh, is not 100% correct. And yes, you might say Sparrow has brown color and improve the performance, but, but if you would have said Sparrow lives in North America, assuming this is factually correct, that might have even further improved the performance. Yeah, it's just interesting because uh, when I read both of the papers, I kind of felt that one is... I felt yeah, that the one was kind one of negates, contradictory. Yeah. yeah, I think it's the first one. That's yeah, kind of and the actually, impression I uh, had. The reason that we did X2 was that uh, for when we were doing food, uh, there were a lot of variations in prompts, like uh, both the wording and, you know, it's like the phrasing of the prompts and everything uh, that uh, 
had a significant impact on performance, although they were conveying the same world knowledge. So we did X2 to actually understand what kind of information matters there. And if we did X2 first, we probably would have done food differently. Okay, uh, can you just explain, how would you have done uh, food differently? Would you have, what kind of prompts, how, how would you have asked it? Probably I wouldn't have conditioned chat GPT to, cause you know, we, we put a great effort to engineer prompts and provide examples that direct chat GPT to just explain about the visual appearance of the concepts. Probably I wouldn't have done that. And I will, I, I would have let the VLM be free to describe everything like, you know, uh, the habitat, the home country, or the different functions of different, uh, uh classes, uh, definitely it seems like these kind of information also have a significant information, significant benefits, which uh, we exclude in X2. That would have one thing, that would have been one thing that I would have definitely changed.